of see me at the middle school talking about this and sort of what it means to be educated. And maybe some sophomore parents remember a little bit about that talk. Um, but part of what I talked about is that there's been a shift from teaching for the known, which is what we grew up with. There are certain we sort of knew maybe what careers would look like. We knew what um, information we needed to learn. And um, now that's just really different. We're really teaching now for the unknown. Um, you know, there are all these statistics. I think Brian cited recently 60% of the jobs that our kids will have, and you know, people graduating in 10 years haven't even been created yet. So we don't really, we can't really teach in the same way that, that we've been, that schools have been teaching for the last 100 years. And so we're, we need to be shifting and thinking about what does it mean to teach for the unknown and what, what about the afterlife of learning? So making teaching relevant, um, not just teaching for a, to a test and then forgetting everything because it didn't really resonate in any meaningful way with the students. Um, so there are lots of skills for the 21st century and I'm gonna put some on the screen and just remind you. But one of, they all include problem solving. So what do we need to, kids to come out, graduate from high school and college with for the 21st century? They need to know how to problem solve. And so I thought it might be good to talk a little bit about that. Um, Tony Wagner is a professor at Harvard. He wrote a book called The Global Achievement Gap about five years ago, which described some new skills for the 21st century and the gap between these skills versus what gets taught and tested in many schools. Um, he's recently written a book called um, Creating Innovators. And um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight is just me uh, processing that and sharing it with you and, and also reflecting on how we're doing a lot of that at Bentley already. So, you know, innovation is necessary to problem solve and um, the long-term health of our economy and also of our world depend on more innovation, creating technologies and solutions for a sustainable planet and affordable health care, social change. Um, and so we want high imagine enabling schools and families to encourage creative capacities in kids. Um, and employers want this too. I, um, I feel like I have to convince you why innovative, innovation is important, but um, the statistics are pretty interesting. There's a 2008 conference board report where creativity and innovation among the top five, were among the top five skills um, that, that uh, employers were looking for that were identified and stimulating innovation and creativity in employees were among the top 10 challenges of, you know, of CEOs in the United States. So what, we're, what they're finding is that kids are graduating for co from college and they're not particularly innovative or creative. They're good at taking tests, they're good at knowing what the teacher wants, but not, maybe not necessarily being able to apply what they know to real problems. And then last year there was a survey that um, GE, the General Elect Electric, did where they surveyed 1,000 senior business executives in 12 countries and 95% of the respondents believe that innovation is the main lever for competitive, for a competitive national economy. And 69% of these leaders agreed that today's innovation is more driven by creativity than by scientific research. So that's interesting, as scientific research gives way to come, just coming up with new ideas. So um, anyway, those are just some interesting statistics that, and obviously we want our kids to be successful in the world in lots of areas, not just business, but um, it's, it's just one kind of perspective point. Okay. So there are really two types of innovation. There's incremental innovation, which is imp you know, improving things that already exist. Products, processes, services. So maybe, for instance, we're building better insulation to reduce um, to reduce the energy that we use. Okay, so maybe we're putting you know, special window, double panel windows in because we know that we want to conserve energy. Um, and you know, part of what we're doing when we're trying to decide which kind of innovation works is we're figuring out what is the right problem to solve, what are the right questions to ask, and those are moving targets. So sometimes incremental innovation is the right answer. Um, and then sometimes we want to find new sources, for instance, of creating energy solar energy or wind energy or electric cars, um, you know, the zip car or other kind of ride share programs, capital bike share where, where they have a hundred bike rental stations in Washington DC where you can kind of hop, off, hop on and off a bike and travel all over the city without schlepping the bike with you maybe on public transportation. And so sometimes um, there are opportunities for disruptive or transformative 
kinds of innovations like iPods or iPads or iPhones, right? Which technology that's changed our lives so much that we maybe we can't even imagine what it was like before we were carrying tiny computers around in our pockets all the time. Um, you know, when we try to turn them off for a day or two, it's like, you know, completely overwhelming. I have a colleague at a school in Marin who I was talking to today, and she said our email server's down, and a part was broken, and they have to like fly it in from some other part of the country, and then they realize something was wrong in the system, and they're out for email for like four days, and it is calamitous, you know. So imagine what our lives were like if we can to before to go before these amazing innovations. But even people, Martin Luther King Jr. was innovative. He took Gandhi's ideas and applied them in a social justice context here, micro lending efforts. Um, programs like Teach for America or the KIPP program, Knowledge is Power program. So there are lots and lots of, it's not just products, but services or programs that disrupt the current markets and displace kind of what we've had before. So when we think about innovators, and we maybe are, and we're all innovative in some way, right? Because um, just, as if you're a parent, you're an innovator, as far as I'm concerned, right? Because you have these moving targets, which are our children, and whether you're, they're small, like mine are, and I'm trying to feed them every day, when one day they loved you know, chicken, and then the next day they think chicken is disgusting, and they can't believe I would ever want to put it in their lunches. Right? I have to be innovative every day when I'm thinking about healthy lunches. And you know, as teenagers, I feel like you get, parents get a lot of practice figuring out how to problem solve and how to work things out, right? Even if it is, as Brian said, a temporary time. So anyway, things that we need to do as innovators are that we want to encourage in our children. Questioning, considering lots of new possibilities, observing, just detecting those small details that could suggest a new way of doing something. Experimenting, trying new things. Teenagers are very good at that. What we want to do there is corral them so that the risk taking that they do is appropriate and safe. And networking, just working with lots of diverse thinkers to gain from varying backgrounds to gain different kinds of perspectives. Um, and then pulling those together and just asso making associations. And that's why um, creativity is not necessarily about the muse visiting you from above, but about really being um, facile in lots of different areas so that you're knowledgeable and you can start pulling things together that ordinarily you might not have thought um, would go together. And um, that's why certain kinds of learners are, can be very creative. Um, students who have attention de deficit hyperactivity disorder are very, very creative because what's, you know, one of the, the way their brain works is that it doesn't, it's hard for them to focus, so there's no, you know, there's no filters, but they're just taking in stuff everywhere. And so students who tend to have attentional, some of you are smiling, because we know who those kids are, um, yeah. you know, sometimes focusing in a traditional school setting is really hard for them, but they have these other gifts that aren't always recognized or are becoming maybe increasingly recognized in schools. So associating lots of these other skills together can help you cultivate new kinds of insights. So, um, as I mentioned before, here are the seven survival skills that Tony Wagner talks about, and I had these up last year. And you know, problem solving is at the top. I've highlighted it in orange for you. But you know, and a lot of these are related. Of course, when you solve a problem, you want to be able to communicate it effectively. You need to be able to analyze information to problem solve and to think critically. You need to be curious and imaginative and agile and be able to collaborate among lots of different kinds of people. So it's all, they're all kind of, as Brian calls it, webby. It's all part of a web. And here's just another model. There are lots of different kind of um, wonky educational paradigms for thinking about learning. And here's another one with the four C's, critical thinking and problem solving, which is more of a PS than a C, but you get my drift. Mm -hmm. Creativity, innovation, communication, and collaboration. So, problem solving is everywhere. Um, so when we talk about problem solving, really what we're saying is that it's the ability to apply what you've learned to problems that you've never seen before. What you, know, what you can do with what you already know. How do you transform and transfer what you know to some situation that you've never seen before? And so it's also, we, you know, we're in a world that's moving from linearity, a kind of steady progress over time, teaching for the known, to f a place of, you know, where we need flexible, creative, innovative thinking. So it's a real paradigm shift in terms of the way that the world is changing and what we need to do to 
educate our young people and ourselves, for that matter, to be able to to be um, players in that new world. So you know, there. But the good news is that problem solving and innovation are teachable, and we're doing a lot of that teaching in the curriculum right now. So, for instance, in the math department, and especially I hear a lot about the geometry curriculum. They're they're giving these hard problems that are meant not to really have an answer that students are going to be frustrated by and need to really chew on and take lots of different angles to get at the heart of what's going on. And they don't like that at all. They want to know, like, how do I do this problem? What's the formula? And we're consciously resisting giving the formula because we want them to be, get, become better at solving problems. In physics, the students are designing experiments, which is so great, you know, because it means failing a couple times and having to iterate over and over again what it is that you're doing. Um, in English and history, we're teaching students how to form ideas and argue about them. And that's, you know, that requires leadership and taking charge and figuring out what it is you're thinking and how you do support it. Um, and so, you know, all these endeavors are creative. And they're all challenging for students who, many of whom feel more comfortable trying to get at the right answer, feeling like teachers know what the right answer is and why won't they tell me right now so I don't have to really think about it or stress about it. And so you might hear them coming home and, and sharing some of that frustration with you um, if they're talking to you at all, which I know sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's something where you could bond. You could, you could say, gra you could grasp to me. Like, feel free to vent about your problem-solving endeavors today. Um, and of course, teenagers do a lot of problem-solving around social stuff, which they probably will not share with you. Um, OK, so here's this great graphic that that Tony Wagner um, has in his book, which I like. It shows creativity and innovation at the heart of expertise, creative thinking skills, and motivation. And really, expertise is about um, you know having knowledge. You need to have a lot not content knowledge. So I'm not saying content knowledge is irrelevant. You need to have lots of different kinds of content knowledge in order to make those amazing dynamic connections. And then you also need the 10,000 hours of mastery that um, Malcolm Gladwell has popularized in Outliers. So you need to become masterful in something. So you're, you're working and practicing and persevering, and, and you, you, know, you have to have that kind of grit and ability to hold on. Um, you want creative thinking skills that allow you to ask questions and make connections and observe and collaborate and network, um, you know, and to figure out how do people approach their, their problems. And you need motivation, which you know Daniel Pink, I talked a little bit about this in a talk last year, but Daniel Pink talks about the three components of motivation being um, mastery, getting better at something that matters to you, autonomy, um, having something that directs, directly connects with our lives that we can that we can direct in our own, um, you know, in our own way, and purpose, you know, yearning to do something that is of serve in the service of something bigger than ourselves. And you know, I'm not gonna. I don't want to take away the dean's thunder. I know sometimes Fred will talk a little bit about fidelity. You know, te the role of teenagers is to develop their own identity, to differentiate themselves and individuate. And fidelity is this really important, um, you know, value that comes with adolescence, where they're looking to be faithful to something and to commit to something, even in the face of it being difficult or nuanced or complicated which is what they realize in high school, is that the world is complicated and nuanced, and that you can still commit to something that's important to you, even if it's not perfect. And they come out the other side, you know, they probably give, parents get, get, a hard, um, get a hard time from their teenagers when they're teenagers, because you're hypocrites for doing all the nuanced things that, well, I think they're nuanced, but teenagers think they're hypocritical, right? Because you're doing something that's inconsistent. And when they come out on the other side of adolescence, they have a better understanding of what that means. But they are, and especially younger adolescents,